Hey everybody, this is Rad Devin, and today I'm going to address your biggest fears about becoming a web developer. I get asked lots of questions about what it's like to become a web developer. For this video, I've picked out four of the questions I get asked really frequently that reveal some underlying fears that people have about the process of transitioning. The first one, am I too old to become a web developer? You probably are. You're probably too old, too young, too experienced, too inexperienced, too expensive, too cheap, too loud, too quiet. The fact is most job postings you would go out and apply to correspond to maybe one position or maybe a handful of positions that a company is hiring for. You're going to be competing with hundreds or maybe even more than a thousand people for those the either the single or the handful of positions that are actually being filled. So for the hundreds of people who are not the one who gets picked, that company or maybe just the algorithm that filters through the applications that are coming in is going to have some great reason that all those hundreds of people were not the one. Despite that, whatever disadvantages you have, you're going to have to find some way to cut through all that noise of those hundreds of other applicants who are all competing for the same handful of positions. That's a little bit of a non-answer, I realize. The real answer, and I'm going to tweak the question just a little bit, the real question here is, is there an age bias when it comes to hiring developers? I think the answer is yes. And I wrote an article a while back that dives a little bit deeper into that. I will link that in the description so you can read more if you want. But ultimately, I don't think it really matters. Because if your approach to getting into the industry is applying for every job you find, you really need to be the best or one of the top five for every one of those positions. Are you that if you're not disadvantaged because of your age? I don't know you personally, but I know that I probably wouldn't be in the top five for any of those positions, even if I weren't almost 40 years old at this point. So what I need to do is I need to focus on something else. I need to focus on a way to cut through all that noise and get this career that I want without regard to that. In my experience, the one thing that speaks louder than any of those superficial metrics that companies are using to filter their applications is whether you can do the work. If you can solve the problems they have, if you're easy to work with, if you communicate well, if your code is readable for the engineers that are coming in to work on it behind you, those attributes are going to cover up a multitude of sins like you're not 25. And in order to do that, you're going to have to get some experience before you get hired. I made a video on how that works, and I will link you to that right now. The next question I'm going to talk about, can I still get work during the pandemic or a recession or the next depression or whatever the economic calamity of the week is? Yes, you can, but you might have more competition. The bad news is that some companies who hire engineers are suffering right now, and they are maybe laying off people or not hiring at the rate they were. The good news is that some companies are thriving right now. Those two aren't necessarily going to balance out. There's probably less opportunity now overall. But what you need to do does not change. You still need to find a way to get work without just playing your ticket in the hiring lottery. Which tech stack should I learn? This is one of those questions that really trips people up early on. They think it's really important that this is going to set the stage for the rest of their career. And for me at least, it's turned out to not be all that important. But you do need somewhere to start. If you need to be hired in a certain part of the country, in a certain industry, or even worse, by a certain company, then this is going to make a huge difference for you. You just need to find out for whichever of those categories you're in, what do other people there use, what tech stack are they using, and you need to dive as deep on that as you possibly can. 
If your goals are more flexible, things get a lot easier. If your goal is just to make a living as a web developer and you don't care as much how that comes about, you could learn the tech stack that is the most exciting to you at the moment, and that will probably be okay. If you already have skills in some language that is commonly used in web development, I would just keep going down that path instead of trying to switch gears. If you already know Python, if you already know Ruby, or maybe you already know some JavaScript, those are great languages to just lean into. If you don't really know anything, and if you're interested in both front-end and back-end web development, you're going to have to learn JavaScript because it's the only language that runs in the browser. So you might as well carry the knowledge you gain learning that on the front end forward into your back end development as well. The reason you're able to make this choice yourself if you're flexible about how you're going to start your career is that by doing freelance work and by selecting the right clients, you're going to be able to dictate those decisions and the client is not really going to care. When something so small generates enough energy to reverse time. Oh, just fix it, 11, or I'll take it to the genius bar. If I get approached by some fashion boutique down the street and they need to sell their clothes online because no one's coming into the store right now, they probably don't care whether I use Ruby or Python to build the back end for that, or if I just set it up on Shopify and make some customizations to a theme for them. They really don't care as long as they can solve that problem they have. That gives you the freedom to make those choices and to choose what you think is the best tech stack to solve that client's problem. As you're doing that, just keep your eyes open for other technologies or other stacks that might do a better job of solving the problem. Make yourself aware of those, be flexible, but in those cases, the stack is not all that important. And the last question I'm going to talk about is, how do I get hired? This is sort of the ultimate career transition question. My approach to this was very different from most people. Unfortunately, I've watched a lot of new developers waste a lot of time on resumes and applications and cover letters. I've watched them play nice with recruiters that then never get back in touch with them. I've watched them take home coding problems and work on them for a solid week only to never hear anything back. And I've even been on the receiving end of some of those things myself a few times. I lost my patience with it pretty quickly though and transitioned into doing freelance work. I like to think of it as hiring myself instead of waiting for someone else to hire me. That was my segue into the industry. So I started making money almost right away. Later on down the line, one of my clients needed more help and made me an offer and hired me on full time. I continue to do freelance work on the side and I've sort of gone back and forth between freelancing and full time work and mixed the two together in the seven years now, I guess, of my career. I seriously doubt I would have been able to apply for any of the jobs I got and get them. Most likely because they already would have had another contractor, like I was at the time, that they could hire to do it. Why go out and look for a total unknown at great expense when you've got somebody right there who's already doing the work? The great thing about this is you don't have to play the dancing monkey as you apply for job after job. Instead, your application is actually doing the work and getting paid to do it. As you probably noticed in the answers to the other questions, this can take care of a lot of other problems for you as well. That's it for this one. I hope you're a little less fearful about your transition now after hearing these, and I will talk to you in the next one.